I'm standing here in Inman Park, one of Atlanta's uh, most lovely and the original suburb of the city of Atlanta. I'm standing right outside of this absolutely beautiful, historic, Victorian-era building known as Atlanta's Trolley Barn. Now, before I tell you why the Trolley Barn has a lot more to do with the church than I may have first realized, I want to give you just a little bit of history and context for this building. Yeah, this building originally was the facility and maintenance uh, hub for this electric streetcar system that serves so much of Atlanta and her surrounding communities. M most in-town historic neighborhoods had access to this electric trolley system and, and people used it. It's what allowed Atlanta to grow up into the Empire State of the South. But eventually, as automobiles began to scale, as more and more Atlantans could afford a car, everything changed. It, it, actually, in 1949, this, this electric car system was abandoned. It was shut down. And this building, as hard as it is to even believe, was almost demolished in the 70s. It, it's interesting how most of our city planners and managers, when you ask them what their plans are, what their hopes are for our city, so much of it revolves around a growing transit system. The, the solution to this problem that we now have, because the, the, the automobile scale that has happened, it, it's actually gone quite well in Atlanta, right? To, to the point where one of the things that our city unfortunately is known for is traffic. And because of that, uh, it, the, the solution to our problem the solution to our transit problem actually was something that our city once had and then abandoned because no one could have guessed, no one could have imagined that our roadways would eventually become choked with cars. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Our church has a lot more to do with the trolley barn than I first guessed. Uh, one, of, one of my first jobs in Atlanta was working for this consulting firm. And I'll never forget one of the first relationships I had in that job was a friend that I made with this older gentleman who was actually recently converted from be being a pastor to being a consultant. My life actually went the other way from consultant to pastor. I guess those two industries have a lot in common, uh, both pretty good at telling other people how they should live their lives. <laughs> But I'll never forget the relationship I had with this guy. Originally, it was all good until we had this one particular interaction in a rental car. I was the younger person, the lower person on the totem pole, so I was driving the rental car. And I remember him sitting in the passenger seat as we were approaching this potential client. And he just eventually learned that I was a Jesus follower, that I, was actually entertaining thoughts at the time of going into ministry. And he used that open door as an opportunity to just really challenge me uh, in a way, uh, really berate me about my own faith. I would come to find out that he had his own story, that he was recently divorced, that his divorce was just as challenging, maybe more so than most divorces. And because of that, the church that he was a part of, the church filled with people that he had sung songs with and recited scripture verses with and sat in groups with, they eventually escorted him to the door and said, you're not really welcomed here anymore. And so it's understandable that he felt the way he felt. Unfortunately, his story highlights the story of so many. So many people have stories like that where all of a sudden the church has become known for more what they're against than what they're actually for. And that's a real challenge. That's a real problem. Maybe even an opportunity for our church. For my friend uh, in consulting, actually his story is a story of a lot of people where their faith, it had just become antiquated, just like the trolley system. It just didn't work for them. It didn't work for him anymore. All because of this simple little idea 
that the church had become known for all that it was against. In fact, if I were to stop today and just ask someone on the street, hey, hey, tell me about what the church is against, most people would be able to give a really long list of all the things that the church doesn't like. Unfortunately though, if I were to stop and ask someone, well, let me ask you a different question. Who is the church for? Not everybody knows the answer to that question because it gets confusing, it gets complex. And we like simple. It's why we like the Avenger movies. It's why we like Star Wars. It's why we like Harry Potter because it's good versus evil. It's cut and dry, it makes sense. It's just simple. And at a time where we've gone through so much as a society, gone through so much as people, we could certainly use something simple right now. Now to ask the question, who is the church for? We've got to look at the history of the church. Who has the church been for? Most people would say, well, the church is for powerful people. The church is for people in big positions with lofty titles people that have a bathroom in their office. A lot of people would say, no, the church is for the rich. The church is for people that can sustain the church, that have the income, the resources, the money to be able to pay for the church. A lot of people would say though, the church is for the good, the morally upright, the people that do the right things, the people that have it together, the people that make it at least seem like they are righteous. But What happens though? What happens when all of a sudden you wake up and realize, oh, there are people that aren't very powerful, that are disadvantaged and it's not even necessarily their fault. What what do you do with people who were once rich, but all of a sudden are not? What, What do you do with people who aren't nearly as good as they seem? See, that's, that's all of our stories. What do you do with that? No, no, to ask the question, to understand the answer to who the church is for, we really need to ask the question, well, who is God for? Who who does he favor? Who is he in love with? Who's on his team? Because the more we all begin to understand who he is, we begin to understand it's not just the powerful. It's not just the rich, and it's certainly not just the good. Because all of us know what it feels like for the bottom to drop out. All of us know what it feels like to lose power, to lose wealth, to to lose a moral standing. And yet God still favors those who are not powerful, who are not wealthy, even those who haven't made all the right choices. And to understand this more fully, to understand what this has to do with us, I wanna look at this passage in Romans 8 where Paul reminds us of the simple and beautiful truth of the gospel. Part of what Paul does in this passage is he, he unifies us He gets us all rallying around the same big idea, which we we could take some unification right now. I I, I don't know that our nation has ever been more divided, more divided politically. I I know even for our church, our church has the potential to feel divided right now. Even when we ask the question, hey, what should our plan be on opening back up? We We got answers really on both ends of the spectrum. We've got people who say, hey, Uh, we're not near ready to come back. And we also got people that were like, oh, you should have been opening up yesterday. But he unifies us around this same idea, this rallying cry. Imagine being in the first century where where, where all of the, the suffering that takes place, the suffering that he references in previous chapters in Romans, all of the suffering has so much to do with what you think God thinks about you. See, if you're wealthy, it was a sign of his blessing. That They had pandemics and if you were healthy, they had no idea about medical care. They had no idea about the way people contracted diseases or virus. It was just a sign of luck that God was 
for you. And if you got it, it was because God was against you. Kind of reminds me of the way I felt as a high schooler when this girl that I was dating broke up with me and told me that it was because God told her to break up with me. It was as if she was saying, hey, God's not for you. And I never forgot it. That's why I'm talking about it still today. But imagine having to read all the tea leaves of what does God think about me based on all of my circumstances? Well, it was in the middle of all of that that Paul drops this in Romans 8. Here's what he says. He makes this massively significant statement. He asks a question. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Well, what things? Well, all of the suffering that we all experience, what should we say about how we interpret God? Does it mean that he's against us? Does it mean that he's for us? What does it say about me? He drops this massive statement. He says, if God is for us, then what can be against us? That if he's for us, then what could come against us? Poverty, difficulty, hardship. No, no, no. This means everything to us, that if he is for us, it says so much about us. He continues in this and he says, if you, if you wanna know how to know, if you wanna know which side you're on, if you wanna know if you're on the for side or, or if you're on the who God is against side, he, he tells us this massive truth. He said that God, he who did not spare his own son, no, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, you wanna know how much God loves you, that God sacrificed, God allowed his son to willingly give up himself for you, for me, not because we're good, not because we were on the right side. No, no he, he did it for people on both sides, that God is for He's for sinners. He's for people that don't have it all together. He's for people that have done wrong, for people that have intentionally and unintentionally done the wrong thing. That's who he's for. And if you ever wonder, if you ever doubt, if you're ever introspective enough to go, well, what does that mean for me? He reminds us that Jesus did not come to sacrifice himself for just the good. Let me say it again that Jesus did not come to sacrifice himself for just the good. No, Jesus came to give up his life for sinners. And we work really hard to get away from that term. We work really hard to not be categorized as sinners. We would rather be people who make mistakes or best of intentioners, best of intentioners, or people who, I, I, I didn't mean to, people that, did the wrong thing unintentionally. That, that's how we would rather see ourselves. But Paul's reminding us, no, 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 no. God's for you. God's for those of you who are sinners because here's the great news about the way God sees sinners. See, we hate the idea because we think, well, sinners are going to be judged. But the life of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the, the example, the model of Jesus reminds us that Jesus did not come to judge sinners. No, Jesus came to do something way better. He came to forgive sinners. It's what he offers to us, every single one of us, forgiveness in his name. Because he is for us. God is for sinners. So if you feel broken, if you feel like there's things in your own life that you can't get over, if you wonder, well, who is God for? God loves, God is for sinners. Sinners like you and sinners like me. I know this season has carried so many different emotions for all of us. 
But I, I hope as we read this last little section of this passage that it would be something that would be encouraging to our heart, to our soul, because of how powerful this message is that Paul explains. I, I love this question. Look at what he asks. He says, well, in verse 36, verse 35, he said, well, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists off all of this. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, as it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, emphatically no. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I love that passage, that there is nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so if you're wondering, well, what does that mean about God's favor for me? It means that his favor is completely contingent upon his grace, not your goodness. It means that, that his blessing on your life, that his blessing is simply this, that he's for you, that he loves you, that he's with us, in all things, no matter what. And so my hope for all of us is that we would rally around, that we, we would deepen ourselves in the simplicity of this gospel message that because God is for us, because he sent his son to give up his own life for us, nothing, nothing can come against us. And so if, if God is for us, then why would the church not be for us? And, and next week, we're gonna talk about what does it mean for us to become a church, to continue to be a church that, that really lives out the expression of that in our community, that convinced that he loves us, convinced that he's for us, that we would continue to be a community of people that are for other people. What? Well, what that means and, and how that is displayed in our community. We'll talk about that. But for, for now, I, I just wonder, maybe for you, maybe this means that you need to accept his love and accept his grace and accept his kindness, that he's for you. No matter what life has been like, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how great you've been, no matter how bad you've been, that who he is, that the essence of his character and his nature, that he is for you, would be emblazoned on your soul. So that when you walk through anything, the fire, when you walk through the good parts of life, through the trials, through the celebrations, that you would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're loved, that he's for you, no matter what. See, this is, our, uh, this is our 20th anniversary. This is our 20th year as a church at Buckhead Church. And it's, it's remarkable to even imagine that because for some people, those of you that have been here since the beginning, maybe it feels like a long time. For me, I'm still relatively new. And so it's all kind of fresh to me, but I, I just wanna take a second and remind all of us that that we're standing in a heritage, that we're standing in this beautiful story that God's been writing through the church for decades and decades and decades, for centuries even. And so we wanna, we wanna remind our community of the best parts of this story, that God is for us. And so I, I'm just here to tell you, to promise to you, that we're going to continue to rally around that simple truth that because God is for you, 
the church is for you. And that we wanna continue to work hard to, to be a church that's more known for who we're for than what we're against. Let me say it again, that we wanna continue to be known as a church, known more by who we're for than what we're against. And so no matter what your history, no matter what your bad or good experience has been with the church or even our church, I'm just telling you, we, we don't have to tear up the rails. We don't have to burn down the barn of the church. No, but we wanna continue to work to change the narrative for our city that because God is for you, it means He's for your city. He's for our city. God is for Atlanta. And because God is for Atlanta, the sky's the limit and the future is so bright. For every one of us and for our church, but also for this beautiful city that we love.